Hey man, thanks for having me. And before I start my sermon, I gotta make a con con confession. You know, we had uh, Taco Bell before we came here, so I hope I make it through the sermon without any <laughs> major incidents, you know. But hey, uh, looking down in the Bible in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says in verse, let me just turn to myself, in verse number 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. We all know these verses. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ, un, Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So the title of my sermon is Faith and Works, Faith and Works. And what I want to preach on tonight is, first, how faith and works are not linked, and secondly, how faith and works are linked. I want to give you a balanced view on faith and works in the Bible. And what we see here in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10, it says that, when it comes to our salvation, obviously it has nothing to do with our works, with the life we live. We're not saved by works. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. But in verse 10 it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. After that we are saved, we should do good works. And obviously, the Bible, you know these verses, that we should add to our faith, you know, works. We should live, we should have a a lively faith. We shouldn't have a dead faith. We should add works to our faith. So I want to give you a balanced view. And in general, as Christians, we should be balanced. We should be balanced in what we believe. We should be balanced in the kind of life we live. Like, let me just give you one example. A lot of people, when they get, get saved, they maybe throw out their TV out of the window. And that's a good thing to do. You know, If you struggle with watching dumb TV series, maybe you should throw out your TV. You could do that. But some people take it overboard to where it's like, oh, you have a TV? Oh, you're in sin. You know, like the, the device itself is somehow sinful, which is dumb. You know, it's the electronic device called television is not sinful in and of itself, obviously. So we want to have a balanced view. So if you uh, go home to someone and see their TV in the living room, it doesn't mean that they are in sin. Because obviously what comes down to is what they're watching, right? So that's just an example. You know, we want to live a balanced life as Christians. We want to have balanced views as Christians. Also, when it just comes to doctrine, we should be balanced in our doctrine, most importantly. And we want to be balanced when it comes to faith and works. So when people get saved, they, they start questioning everything, and that's good. I believe when somebody gets saved, they should question the life they have been living. They should question their convictions they have. They should question you know, what they have believed before. They should question that, right? And they should be, and it's good to be a bit extreme when you get saved, to just turn your life around. You should do that. But then you should normalize. You should become a bit more normal and not be some radical kind of extreme person. We shouldn't be extreme as Christians. We're seen as extreme by this world, and that's fine because this world is going obviously down the toilet, but we aren't extreme here. You know, we want to just believe what the Bible says and want to live a life according to the Bible that is balanced. Now, when somebody gets newly saved, they sometimes go just to an extreme when it comes to defending salvation by grace through faith. We should absolutely defend this core doctrine against heretics, but they could go to an extreme to where you know, somebody says something, something wishy-washy about works, something that sounds a bit off. Oh, they're a reprobate. You know, they're for sure not saved. But you know, here's the thing. When we knock on a door and they say, well, yeah, it's by having a relationship with Jesus, you know, it, it doesn't automatically mean that that person isn't saved. You maybe want to ask another question. Okay, so could you ever do something to lose your salvation? No, absolutely not. Okay, well, then that person is probably saved, even though they said something that was a bit off. So you don't want to go overboard in defending doctrines, even if those are very important and good doctrines, you could take any good doctrine to a weird extreme and just, just, um, yeah, just offend people without any reason and just write off people, oh, they're for sure not saved, those are reprobates, just because they said something a little bit off. So we want to, don't want to go to that extreme. So when it comes to faith and works, my first point is how faith and works are not linked. So obviously when we talk about salvation, about actually getting saved, faith and works are not linked in any way. 
It doesn't matter what kind of life you're living. Like it says in the hymn, To God be the glory, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Amen? That's a good verse, you know. The vilest offender. I believe that is true. Even the vilest offender out there, if they were to believe, they would get saved. It's just that we obviously also believe in the reprobate doctrine, so we know that the vilest offenders out there just don't believe. But here's the thing, Jesus died for their sins, so if they would believe, if they could believe, you know, they would get saved, obviously. It's just that they can't believe. So when it comes to getting saved, there is no relationship between faith and works. It's faith only without the deeds of the law, without works. And I just want to make that real clear before you like, freak out when I get to my second point, how faith and works are linked in some ways. Don't freak out, okay? When it comes to getting saved, obviously, there's no connection between faith and works. So we already read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, just to recap. For by grace are you saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the Bible makes it really clear that faith and works in the context of salvation are polar opposites. They're completely different things. It's by grace, through faith. So faith is the means by which we get saved. It's not of works. So here's one extreme when it comes to getting saved, salvation by works. Or you can't just live however you want. Or you need to get baptized or whatever. That's the typical extreme that we hear, right? Or you also need to do some kind of work. It's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's by faith, yeah. But even when we talk to someone at the door, it sometimes will just be good, be truthful. They don't even mention Jesus at all, right? It's, it's just so weird. And then we say, well, you know, actually the Bible says, you know, source, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, amen. So then they suddenly agree, but they didn't even mention Jesus before, right? But, you know, that's what people usually think. You know, that's what our flesh wants is to do good works and to, but, you know, when it comes to salvation, obviously our good works don't matter. Now, the other extreme, though, is, oh, you just can't do anything. You can't even believe. You can't even believe. It's just that God gives you faith. That's what some extreme Calvinists believe. Oh, you can't do anything. You can't even believe. Well, here's the thing, though. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So the one thing you need to do is to believe in Jesus Christ. So is that something you need to do? Yes, absolutely. You need to believe. That's something you need to do. So the other dumb extreme is, oh, there's nothing you can do. You can't even believe. God just gives you faith. How dumb is that? And I, I kind of touched on that already in my last sermon, I believe, a couple of months ago. So I don't want to uh, reiterate that, but... Those are two extremes, you know, salvation by works and salvation by I don't know how. And I, I even heard this, this one, uh, like, extreme Calvinist guy say that, well, he, he didn't even want to get saved. He didn't even want to get saved. It's just that he's one of the elect. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, if you don't want to get saved, you don't get saved. <laughs> you know. But, so we don't want to go to either one extreme or the other. We want to actually believe and, and live our way, the li the, our, way, our lives, I'm sorry, the way the Bible says it, and um, be balanced in our beliefs and our practices. So turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, and I'm just going to start reading in verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So the Bible is very clear that we not only get saved without works, without doing anything good. And also I just want to say, that what does work even mean? Obviously when it's talking about works in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, obviously it's talking about good works. That's what's implied. It's not talking about bad works, obviously. So when it's talking about works here, it's basically something that someone could say, well, well done, awesome, good job, now you earned it. It's, it's it's a good deed whereby you could earn something. That's what the Bible means with works, good works. Because obviously we need to believe in Jesus Christ. But is that a good work in the sense that somebody would say, oh, no, well done, now you earned it, you got it. Obviously not, because you just received the gift, you just trust Jesus, what he did. 
if that kind of makes sense. So, um, but the Bible is also really clear that even after we got saved without any works, by just believing in Jesus Christ, that even after that, you know, somebody could live a life without doing anything good, and they're still going to heaven. Even if they just waste their time on earth, don't do anything good, they still go to heaven. Why? Because of their faith, and the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Without works. I mean, that's really obvious. Now, some people would say, well, yeah, that's true, but that just applies to the moment when somebody gets saved. Obviously, that's without works, but once they are saved, they would automatically have the good works that follow faith. They would like have uh, works to prove their salvation or something. Works would just automatically follow. But here's the thing, though. <laughs> Getting saved, yes, is a one-time thing, but faith is not a one-time thing. Once you believe in Jesus, you will continue believing in Jesus. It's not that you just believe once and then you stop believing but you're still saved because you believed once. No, that doesn't happen. Anybody who says, I was a Christian, I believed in Jesus, but now I'm an atheist, was never saved. Because once you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost, and you're sealed with the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. So once you're saved, you will always believe in Jesus. If somebody stops believing in Jesus, so to say, they were never saved. So faith is not a one-time thing, okay? So we don't want to go to this, this extreme in defending salvation by grace through faith and oneself always saved, what's well, a one-time thing? So if somebody stops believing, they're still saved because it's a one-time thing. No, that's dumb. That's not a balanced view. So, <clears throat> even, so God basically looks down on someone who believes, who has faith. They are saved, but he worketh not. He doesn't do any good works. His faith is counted for righteousness. That person is still righteous. Nothing changes. Now turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Obviously, then we, we get that argument, well, faith with our, with our works is dead. Obviously, you know, you know that you know, whenever we bring that up, faith with our works is dead. And the other day, we knocked on this door of a Muslim, and uh, we were trying to explain to him salvation by grace through faith. And this, this Muslim, like I kid you not, this Muslim told us, faith with our works is dead. A Muslim! He said, the, he said the same thing as non-denom Christians out there. Like non-denom, unsaved Christians. I'm not saying that every non-denom Christian isn't saved. That's not what I'm saying. But like the, the typical thing you would hear from like unsaved non-denom Christians or even sometimes unsaved Baptists, you know. Oh, faith with works is dead. Why? Because it's just the same religion. It's just works. So it makes sense that even a Muslim would say that. But isn't that funny? So, here's the thing, though. What is faith without works? Faith without works is that, okay? But what saves us? Well, according to Romans chapter 4, verse 5, it, it says, but to him that worketh not, so he doesn't have any good works, but believeth on him, so he has faith, he believes, he doesn't have the works. Faith without works is that. He has dead faith. Hmm, seems like dead faith saves what about that? Seems to me like dead faith, faith saves. And not only that, I want to take it a step further, and I want to say that only dead faith can save you. That's literally the only faith that can save you. It's a dead faith without works. Because how do you get saved without works? So if you want to have like a lively faith, like an active faith that, that helps others, you, you add works, right? But when it comes to getting saved, you, you, like an unbeliever can't do anything good where God would say, well done, I'm going to give you rewards. No, their works don't matter. They couldn't even do anything. The only thing they can do is just have dead faith in Jesus. So literally the only thing that saves you is having dead faith. Well, faith where the works is dead. Yeah, and it saves you. I mean, it's that simple. So, when it comes to getting saved, it's, it's really simple. It's just faith without works. And just want to lay this groundwork. Obviously, you know that. But I just want to lay this groundwork because before I get into my second point, how faith and works are links. 
So you're still there in James chapter 2. Look down in verse 21. James chapter 2, verse 21, the Bible says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So faith can, can work with works. Faith, can, faith goes, can go hand in hand with works, and it should go hand in hand. We should add works to our faith once we are saved without works. That is something we should do, just like we read in Ephesians 2, 2 chapter, um, in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we should walk in them. It's not automatically, it's a commandment. So we can make faith perfect. So obviously, James chapter 2 isn't telling us how to get saved. It's telling us how to make faith perfect. You don't start out having perfect faith. You start out having dead faith. And maybe you will die having dead faith. I don't hope that, but that could happen. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, you don't have to turn there, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So obviously the first step to pleasing God is having faith but then you should also make your faith perfect so that your faith helps other people. That people could say, wow, yeah, this person is a, is a person of faith. That's a man of faith. You know, Abraham was a man of faith. Why? Because we could see his works. That's what we can see as people, as humans, right? We see their works. Why did Abraham do these works? Because he had great faith. Then goes on to say in James chapter 2, verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And, I want you to notice that, and he was called the friend of God. Notice this word. It says, and he was called the friend of God. That's something people want to leave out, and they say, oh, you know, he, his faith wrought with his works. So, the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness. So see, you can't just live however you want. You need to also have works. You need to have saving faith. Saving faith is dead faith. Okay? That's saving faith. You need to have saving faith, which is basically faith plus works. You know, that's, that's, that's dumb. That's heresy. But look what it says. It says, and he was called the friend of God. So what the Bible is saying, in addition to already being saved by grace through faith, in addition, and he was called the friend of God. In addition to being already saved, he was also called the friend of God. Why? Because he had works. He, had, he added works to his faith, and that's why he was called the friend of God. So one way to interpret James chapter 2 is to say, well, it's justification in the sight of men, that people could say, wow, yeah, this person really has great faith because of their works. That makes sense, you know. Because Abraham went that far to, to even offering and sacrificing his son Isaac. Obviously, he didn't do that in the end, but he would have done it. The Bible is very clear about that. And by that, you know, he is saved in our eyes. He's justified in our sight. Because we can see, okay, yeah, he actually had great faith. So, James chapter 2, on the one hand, teaches justification in the sight of men. Not in the sight of God, but in the sight of men. But also in, this, in these verses, it teaches justification in the sight of God. And I want to explain this to you. Because, let me give you an example. Like, uh, the other day, um, Dennis and Eileen, they brought me something from barbecue. We have our German visitors here. They brought me something from Barbecue. It's this great barbecue place in Tempe. And uh, you should totally check it out. And this, version, this sermon is brought to you by Barbecue. And you can click the affiliate link below and get 10% off. But uh, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so they, they, I was saying, well, hey, I don't, I don't want to eat lunch today. I just uh, didn't get to do everything I wanted to do the last couple of days. I need to just work. And, but they brought me lunch. And they were justified by works. Couldn't I say that they were justified by works in my sight in the sense that now they are justified to be called my friends because they did this for me? Couldn't I say that? 
they are justified to be called my friends because they did something good for me. They added works. You know, couldn't I say that, hey, uh, Gabriel did something good for me, so now he's justified to be my friend? Couldn't I say that? He's justified. You know, you get justified by works in the sense that you will be called the friend of someone. Right? Makes sense, of course. Now, couldn't God also say, well, Abraham did these works, so now he's justified that I can call him my friend because he did these works. So he was justified by works to be called the friend of God. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And in addition to that, he was called the friend of God by works. By works he was justified to be called the friend of God. What's so ridiculous about heretics who twist James chapter 2 is when, when they want to say that he, Abraham actually, you know, he had saving faith, you know, basically saying he got saved by uh, faith plus works. It, it is so ridiculous because he was, years before he offered up Isaac, years and years before that, he was already saved by faith. The Bible already told us that he was that he was saved by, by faith. And Romans chapter 4 makes it real clear. We can turn there real quick to Romans chapter 4. It says in verse 1, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were off to glory, but not before God. Not before God. He was already saved before he offered up Isaac. Oh, he had saving faith, you know, and he really got saved when he offered up Isaac. No, he was already saved without works. So, when it says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar, it has to be, be talking about something totally different, apart from his salvation. But obviously, his faith and his works were linked. Because of his great faith, he did a great work. So, my first point was how faith and works are not linked when it comes to getting saved. Once we are saved, there is a link between faith and works because we should do Good works, we should add to our faith works to perfect our faith, to be, um, to help other people, you know, so that we could be justified in their sight, or also to be justified in God's sight, to be called God's friend. I mean, what a, what a great title. Don't you want to be called the friend of God? Don't you want to reach that status to be called the friend of God? To be that close to God? To have such a close walk? But it's not by getting saved alone. It's also by works. So yes, in that sense, it's faith plus works. There's a link between faith and works if you want to get called the friend of God. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 15, verse 14. John chapter 15, verse 14. So people who say, you know, I have a relationship with Jesus, they obviously are misled. They're, they're, they were misguided about that because they... You know, and it doesn't mean that they're all just unsaved, but somebody who says, I have a relationship with Jesus, usually they have a wrong understanding, and they apply this to salvation. But the Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 14, ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. So if you want to have a relationship with Jesus, a good relationship with Jesus, if you want to be his friend, what does the Bible say? Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Now, do you get saved? When you do whatsoever Jesus commanded you, absolutely not. You need to just believe in Jesus. So you're, that's a great verse. You should totally underline that in your soul winning Bible because whenever somebody brings up this relationship with Jesus, show them this verse. It's so simple. They will get it. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I commanded you. Ask that person at the door, is that how you get saved? Most of them would say no because they already kind of realized, okay, it's, it's not really by works. They're kind of misguided, you know, they're still not safe, maybe they think, oh, you know, but you still got to get baptized or whatever. But you can clear that up because nobody would, usually people don't say, you have to obey all the commandments. You just have to be perfect. You just have to follow everything Jesus said. But basically, if you really want to be the best friend of Jesus, you would have to do everything Jesus said, if you do whatsoever I commanded you. Is that how you get saved? No. Almost everybody realizes that. So having a relationship with Jesus is not getting saved. But once you're saved, you can add works and 
and perfect your faith and be called eventually a friend of God, just like Abraham. And also in John chapter 14, verse 15, so it's John chapter 15, 14, and John chapter 14, 15. It's very easy to rem remember. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, I have this relationship with Jesus. I just love Jesus. Well, you know, you've got to keep his commandments, though. And most people who say that, I just love Jesus, have this relationship with Jesus, usually they are not that good about keeping the commandments. You know, it's just facts. So those are great verses to, to uh, memorize and underline in your Bible if you want to clear up that confusion about relationship with Jesus. Somebody is uh, misguided about that. But um, I want to read to you from 2 Peter 1, verse 5. It's just a, just a bonus verse. It says in 2 Peter 1, verse 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and so on. Because this list of things we should add to our faith. We should perfect our faith. So when it comes to getting saved, faith and works are not linked whatsoever. There's no relationship between faith and works. But faith and works are linked when it comes to getting called a friend of God. You know, we should add to our faith works. We shouldn't just stop there. Okay, I'm safe. Boom, I'm done. That's it. No, we should perfect our faith and, um, and be called the friend of God. That is something we should strive for. You should want to strive for. Be called a friend of God. So I, I'm showing you these, these verses because those are verses that could be hard to understand, like in James chapter 2. You know. That is something people stumble, stumble over, and um, they, they have problems understanding that. So maybe that's helped you to kind of see both perspectives. Yes, obviously... It, Overall, James chapter 2, I would say, is talking about justification in the sight of men, but also in the sight of God in the sense of getting called the friend of God by works. Now, when it comes to how faith and works are linked, I would even say that your salvation and works can be linked. And I want to explain this to you, okay? And this is another kind of hard-to-understand passage that I want to show you in Hebrews chapter 6, Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 6, where it's really obvious that there is a link between your salvation and the works that you do. And I want to show you this. Hebrews chapter 6, I'm going to start reading in verse 4. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted, verse 5, the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, it's impossible to renew them again. They're reprobate. They can't get saved. To renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to, to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth, verse 7, which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth, receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burnt. But, beloved, we're persuaded better things of you. Everything is fine. I was just saying that you seem kind of reprobate, but, beloved, it seems fine. I don't really think you're reprobate. You kind of seem like reprobates, but, beloved, we're persuaded better things of you. And things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. I mean, like, imagine getting this letter. <laughs> imagine getting this chapter as a letter. I mean, that is a harsh rebuke. That is a stern warning. <laughs> like, think about it. He's like basically saying, like, you guys seem like a bunch of reprobates. There's probably no hope for you. But, you know, beloved, you know, it's not really what we think about you. It's just that you know, we're kind of concerned about you. And this is like a stern warning. This is harsh. So the Apostle Paul or, you know, whoever wrote... Hebrews, I'm just going to call him the Apostle Paul, he was obviously concerned about their salvation. He had, you know, strong doubts about their salvation. Hey, what's wrong with you guys? Seems like you aren't even saved. Seems like you're reprobates. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For, now, what does this for mean? Basically, now he's going to give the reason, right? So he's basically saying, why are we persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation? Why is that? What is the reason? 
The reason is in verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. So, read it again, okay? Verses 9 and 10. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. What is the reason? The reason is, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. He makes it really clear that he's talking about their works. Work and labor, those are synonyms. Their work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. So, let me ask you, the man here, just give me an answer. Doesn't the Bible make a link, make a connection between their salvation and their works? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Verse 10 is clearly connected to verse 9. And that's why I'm saying that we want to have balanced views. I don't want to approach the Bible with a preconceived idea, with just going overboard and defending a, a good doctrine so that I would just you know, ignore passages that are kind of hard to understand. It kind of seemed to seem, okay, I want to stress this, seem to go against what I believe. I don't want to just apply my preconceived idea, my beliefs to the Bible. I want to apply the Bible, you know, and, and learn from the Bible and change my beliefs. I want to believe what the Bible actually says. So if you come to these verses where salvation is clearly linked to the works that they do, I don't want to just say, well, you know, it's, it has to, be, has to mean something different. Why, though? I mean, 4 clearly links verses, verse 10 to verse 9. Now, I want to point out something really important in verse 10, okay? Is the Apostle Paul saying, oh, now that, that you do these kind of works, now I can pronounce you saved? Is that what he's saying? Is he saying, I see you doing these works because you do these, this work and labor of love? Oh, now you, you do these good works. Even though I, I, I kind of question your salvation, hey, I think you may, maybe some of you are even reprobates. But you have all these good works, now I pronounce you saved. That's not what he's saying. Look what it says. He says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. He's not saying that he is able to judge their motivation, that, this, that it's a work and labor out of pure and unfeigned love. He's saying God is not unrighteous to forget their work. God knows what's in their hearts. So he's basically saying, yeah, you, you do this work and labor of love, you know. It seems, to, to us, it, it seems like a good work that you're doing. Yeah. God is not unrighteous. So if that's actually a work and labor of love, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. God knows their motivation. So it's not that the Apostle Paul himself is just pronouncing them safe based on their works. We can't do that because we can't actually test, fully test the motivation of some people, you know, the, the motivation behind their works. We can't do that. We can't look into, into their hearts. But God can, though. That's why he brings up God specifically. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Now turn, if you would, to 1 John ver chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> And while you turn there, I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3. It reads, Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by longsuffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. So, those are good virtues and good works that apply to every Christian, not just to people in the ministry. Obviously, he's talking about the ministry here in context, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. But as the ministers of God, you know, w with an office in the church or something, it's not that they just have a completely different standard. Obviously, all these virtues and all these good works apply to every Christian. Every Christian should have unfeigned love. That's really what I want to focus on, because in uh, Hebrews 6, verse 10, it was saying, for God is not unrighteous, unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. So, having love unfeigned is a purely Christian thing. It is something that you only can have as a Christian. 
It is love of, out of a pure heart, love out of pure motivation, without wanting to receive anything back. It's self-sacrificial. And we should have this kind of love as Christians. We are able to have this love, but we don't always show it, right? But here's the thing. If you actually have unfeigned love and do a work and labor of love, well, it shows, and I'm going to get to that, that you have the Holy Spirit. And I want to explain that more in the next verses. But um, yeah, love unfeigned, that is self-sacrificial. Uh, love out of a pure motivation. And it's basically the love where somebody would say, well, why are we even doing this? Why are you even doing this? What's the reason? What, like, what's the reward you get? Why? But, you know, we should have the love of Christ where it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Like, why? I don't get it. I don't understand it. Which passeth knowledge that he might be filled with all fullness of God. Now, obviously, we won't ever reach that standard, the love of Christ which passeth, passeth knowledge, but we can at least show some of that love to other people because we have the Holy Ghost. We are partakers of divine nature. And you're still there in 1 John chapter 4. I'm just going to read to you from 1 Peter and chapter 1. It reads in verse 21, Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So it's saying, seeing that you have purified your souls, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. How? In obeying the truth. Now, how do you obey truth? How do you obey facts? How do you obey, um, not, not like a commandment, but how do you obey facts and truth? By believing it. So if you want to obey the gospel, you believe the gospel. If it's talking about commandments, obeying commandments, you would do those commandments. But if it's talking about truth or about the gospel, it's, by believing the gospel. That's how you obey the gospel. So, by believing the gospel, we purified our souls through the Spirit. And what's the goal? Obviously, when you think about believing in Jesus Christ, it's mainly about getting saved. But God has other goals for us. You know, we're sa um, what does it say? Uh, that we are created unto good works. So, what is a goal? To have unfeigned love of the brethren. Now that we are saved, now that we are purified through the Spirit, we have unfeigned love of the brethren. So if somebody just doesn't feel any love for their brothers in Christ, they're not saved. Sorry. And I can't test that. I can't, like, look into their heart. But if somebody doesn't have any love in their heart, you know, that person is not saved. Oh, but what if they believe? No, they don't believe. Because if you believe, you're purified through the Spirit and true unfeigned love of the brethren. You have the Spirit of God, you have the ability to have, have unfeigned love. And if you just never feel any kind of love for your brothers in Christ, you're not saved. It's that simple. Now, you're in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6. Look down what it says in verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us, not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And these verses, verses 6 and 7, it, it seems like they're not connected. It seems like, a, like another, like a new topic in verse 7, we're, we're starting to talk about love. But those verses, 6 and 7, are actually very much connected. They form one unit. And I want to explain this to you before I get into um, the more important part here. But I want to explain to you how these verses go together, okay? So, in verse 6 it says, He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God, meaning not saved, heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, if somebody is saved, they would listen to us. If we talk about the things of God, if we talk about doctrine, if we go sowing, preach the gospel, or... Obviously, no, that is, that is an example, because obviously if we go sowing, we talk to unbelievers. But I'm, I'm saying, if somebody is saved, and we talk about the things of God, about the Bible, they would hear us, they would listen to us, meaning they would get it. 
you know, not just hear like the sound, they would get it. Yeah. They, they would have ears to hear. But if somebody doesn't listen to us, if somebody says, well, yeah, I mean, we, we show them, I don't know, once saved, always saved in the Bible, really clear verses, and they don't want to believe it, they don't hear us, it's because they are not saved. If they don't hear us, they are not saved. Now, it's kind of the same principle in verse 7, right? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. They are saved and knoweth God. So here, how, the, how these verses go together. If you're of God, if you're born of God, you listen to, you, you would understand and believe correct doctrine, clear-cut doctrines from the Bible. You would believe it because you're saved. If somebody doesn't believe clear-cut doctrines from the Bible, not saved. And I'm not talking about like uh, doctrines that are kind of connected to tradition like the pre-trip rapture where people just really want to hold on to it, you know. I'm just talking about like really clear-cut things. If they don't want to listen to us, they are not saved. Just like that, if, if somebody doesn't have actual love, they are not saved, they are not of God. Now, we as Baptists, who really emphasize the doctrine, we're called unloving sometimes, right? Like, we bring the doctrine, we preach, we preach doctrine, and uh, we want to make it crystal clear, and don't, we aren't wishy-washy, you know, we don't go with every wind of doctrine. Oh, that's so unloving. But look, if somebody is saved, they would have, they would listen to the doctrine and have love in their hearts. If somebody says, oh, I love Jesus, I just love Jesus so much. It's just all about love. You know, and I just want to love all the Catholics and all the Orthodox. We're all brothers in Christ. I just want to love. I just want to focus on the doctrine. That person isn't saved. If you, if you have actual love, if you're born of God, you would also love doctrine. You would also listen to doctrine. You would get the doctrine. You can't just say, I love Jesus, without loving the doctrine. It goes hand in hand. If you're saved, you will get the doctrine. You would believe it, and you would have love. So, we're as Baptists, we're very loving. We're saved. We have love, and we have the doctrine. Oh, I just don't care that much about the doctrine. I just want to have all this division. But I just really love, love, love. No, you don't. You are a liar. It's that simple. So that's how these verses are actually very much connected. Now, what I want to focus on, focus on though, is uh, the fact that you, you cannot have actual love in your heart if you're not saved. That's what these verses clearly imply. In verse 8, it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. And it also says uh, in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Love is of God. You can't find love anywhere else, only with God. So if somebody isn't saved, it's obvious that they don't have love. They cannot have actual love. Now it says in, you don't have to turn there, but in 2 Peter 1 verse 4 it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. So love is of God. It's in God's nature. God is love. You need to be a partaker of divine nature to have love yourself. Having escaped <coughs> sorry, the corruption that is in the world through lust. So the fact that the Hebrews apparently did this work and labor of love proves that they were saved. Now, the Apostle Paul isn't saying that, you know, I see this and I pronounce you safe. He's saying God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of, uh, work and labor of love. God is judging that. God is seeing that. You know, he, he can only kind of assume. Well, I, I, I can assume that you guys are saved. I mean, I really doubt your salvation and some of you guys are probably reprobates. So, that, I mean, you're not in a good condition, but... I kind of assume, because it kind of seems like you did this ministry for the saints and you do this work and labor of love. I kind of assume, though, that you are saved. Like, he's, he's not, like, clear-cut on that. He's not just for sure pronouncing them saved. That's why he's saying God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. God can see that. What's their motivation? If their motivation is actual love on feigned, it proves that they are saved. And God is not unrighteous to forget their work. 
So is salvation and works connected in a way? Absolutely. Absolutely. You cannot do a work and labor of love if you're not saved. And the fact that you do a work and labor of love and minister unto the saints and do minister, like it says in Hebrews chapter 6, proves that you're saved. It doesn't mean that that proves to other people necessarily. You know, because people could be wrong with their judgment. People can't really see your motivation. But, so this is not something we could necessarily practically apply. This is doctrine, you know. And um, this is how salvation and works in these verses are connected. And I, I hope that I, I can help you understand these verses better. Because when I read these verses the first couple of times, I was like, like I don't get it. Because obviously, you know, you believe Salvation by grace through faith, and this, this kind of seems weird, you know. Obviously, hey, it's the word of God, amen. This is what it says, you know. I don't want to, like, twist the word of God just to uh, make it fit some preconceived idea. Okay. But the first couple of times this, I mean, yeah, it just seems hard, you know. It's just maybe a bit hard to understand the, the, the fact that Clearly, verses 9 and 10 in Hebrews chapter 6 are connected. That salvation and works in these verses are connected. But it's that, yes, the, these works that they did out of love, those are a proof, but it's not that the Apostle Paul could fully judge that. He just kind of had an assumption. But in the end, who is the one who can really judge that? It's God who is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. So I hope that makes sense to you. And I hope that was uh, easy to understand. Now, turning your Bibles to Titus 1, chapter 16. Titus, 1, chapter, Titus chapter 1, verse 16, I'm sorry. Titus 1, 16. Obviously, you know that Hebrews chapter 6 is talking about reprobates, right? About people who cannot get saved anymore. They are beyond the hope of salvation. They have heard the gospel. And it, Hebrews chapter 6 takes the reprobate doctrine further than Romans chapter 1, because in Romans chapter 1, it's basically, oh, people, they basically realize that there needs to be one true God who created everything. It's not that they actually heard the gospel. For somebody to, to get reprobated, to go beyond the hope of salvation, they don't actually have to hear the whole gospel. According to Romans chapter 1, it's enough that they just realize that, <clears throat> that there is one true God who created everything, but they just want to reject that. They just want to totally reject that and, and just hate God. Even with their like, little idea that they have of God. But Hebrews chapter 6 takes it further and says, you know, they, they already uh, were tasted the whole, um, the, let me turn there. They, Hebrews chapter 6, it says, they have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the word to come. You know, they, they have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. So they were clearly preached the gospel. It takes it even further and makes it really clear, you know, they, they, they fall away, meaning they, they didn't end up believing and they rejected the word of God. It's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. They cannot get saved. It's clearly talking about reprobates. So the way I want to connect this to Titus 1.16, look what it says in Titus 1.16. It says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So if these people in Hebrews chapter 6 were actually reprobates, they could not have done a work and labor of love. Because reprobates are reprobate not only concerning the faith, they're reprobate unto every good work. And I, I want you to, to let that verse sink in for a second. Think about it. God hates these people so much that he doesn't even want them to do any good work. Think about it. They, he reprobated them, he rejected them unto every good work. They are not able to do any good work. That's how much God hates them. I mean, usually, doesn't God value good works? Absolutely. God values good works. But when it comes to reprobates, I don't want you guys to do any good work. Think about it. So here's the thing, if you want to have anything good in this life, if you want to get anything good out of this life, you have to do 
good works unto others. You need, to do, you need to be good unto others. God basically says, hey, I hate you so much. I don't want you to have anything good in this life. I don't want you to do anything good for anybody. So that you live the most miserable life imaginable. Just the most horrible life imaginable. Just live and die in misery. Think about it. That's how much God hates these people, these reprobates who hate him, haters of God. I don't want you to get anything good. You're not able anymore to do anything good. That's intense. They reprobate unto every good work. They cannot do a work and labor of love. So the fact that the Hebrews apparently did this work and labor of love shows that they weren't reprobates. And not only that, it shows, you know, if they actually did that out of the right motivation, actually out of unfeigned love, God knows, it proves that they were saved. Because if they were reprobates, they were reprobate, they would be also reprobate under every good work. <clears throat> So, you know, reprobates are not only reprobate concerning the faith. It's not only that they cannot get saved anymore. They can't even do anything good. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 31, you don't have to turn there. It says, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. So, the, the love is love community, the LIL community, they're so loving. They're without natural affection. Isn't it funny that the love is love community is the community without natural affection, without any love? That is reprobate unto every good work. But they're so loving. They're so good with kids. Right? It's disgusting. They're so good with kids. They're so loving. You know, we can trust them with our kids. No, you can't. They're unmerciful. They're without natural affection. But people get deceived by homos all the time. Oh, that Starbucks employee, he was so nice to me the other day. Like, like every time I go to Starbucks, and I don't go to Starbucks that often, but every time I go to Starbucks, it's like, please, no fact today. Please, no fact today. <laughs> <laughs> Spare me. <laughs> people get deceived by them. They think they're so loving, you know. I'm so good with kids. I, I, I watched this, this movie the other day, The Sound of Freedom. Who has watched that? Yeah, that, that was a good movie. That was a good documentary. And what really stood out to me is that they even quoted or paraphrased this verse where Jesus is saying that it were better if a millstone were cast about, uh, were hanging about his neck and he were cast or, or drowned in, in the depth of the sea. Talking about people who offend children, about pedophiles. And they correctly applied this verse to pedophiles. Now, when I show this verse to Christians, usually they, oh, no, no, it's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about pedophiles. What a shame. Even some worldly movie producers get it. It's talking about pedophiles. But then Christians are like, oh, no, it's not talking about pedophiles. What a shame. How ridiculous. But the point I want to make is, people get deceived by reprobates, by homos all the time, they're so loving, they're so nice. See, it just goes to show that we can't judge someone's salvation by the seemingly good works that they do. Because the same people who seem so nice are reprobate unto every good work. All the works that they do, even if they seem really, really nice, are bad works. They have the wrong motivation. So, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we should go around judging people by their works. Absolutely not. That's why I made the first point how faith and works are not linked. You know, our salvation, getting saved, has absolutely nothing to do with good works. Somebody lives just the most messed up life, but they actually believed in Jesus. They are saved, yes. At the same time, though, there is a connection in the sense that you can only do a work and labor of love if you're actually saved. If you're, and if you actually do this work and labor of love, 
out of unfeigned love, out of a pure heart, it proves that you're safe. But this is not something that we can go around judging. We might have a misconception about the work somebody does. You know, just like people get deceived by the reprobates and think they are so loving. You know, people could be wrong about the intentions of other people, right? So, turning the Bible to Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. And I want to end the sermon on, on this point that we as humans, we can't really judge someone's salvation by the seemingly good works that they do. You know, obviously, as I said, if somebody actually has unfeigned love, they do a work out of unfeigned love, yes, that means that they are saved. Absolutely, because without being saved, you don't have the, even the ability to have unfeigned love. But this is not something we can go around judging. We can only judge what comes out of a person's mouth, right? Now it says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So this, this really simple little work, God will reward even this. So think about it. If, if somebody doesn't do anything good, but they would do this one thing, the Bible says, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Now the Bible makes it really clear. Turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible makes it really clear that there are people who don't have any good works. They go to heaven without any good works, without having done anything that is worth rewarding. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. <clears throat> but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So, your works are tested in the judgment seat of Christ, and if those works are burned, you know, hey, you shall suffer loss. You don't get any wars, but you still go to heaven. So the Bible is very clear that there are, that there are those people, that there will be those people who go to heaven, but they suffer loss. They don't have anything good. See, what does that mean? They didn't even give this cup of water to a disciple. They didn't even manage to do that. Because it says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, Whosoever shall give to drink one of the, unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. But then there are those people that we read about that shall suffer loss. They don't have any reward. They still go to heaven. They didn't even give a cold cup of water to a disciple. The Bible says, he shall in no wise lose his reward. They didn't even manage to do this. So I just want to make it really clear uh, before I finish my sermon that there are all those people, they haven't done anything good. They had the ability to show unfeigned love, but they didn't do it. So we can't really go around saying, oh, this person is safe because they did this. This person not, is not safe because they did that. Now, obviously, there are exceptions. Like when it comes to reprobates, you know, there are works that show that they are reprobates. But, you know, even in the case of reprobates, not every reprobate is automatically just an open sodomite or something. So you, you don't always know. But, you know, if they have, uh, if they do abominable works that they are only capable to do because they are reprobate, well, obviously they are reprobate. We can judge their, their not salvation by their works. We can judge their reprobation by their works. So, I hope this sermon helps you to have a to, to get a balanced view on faith and works, to see that you know, when it comes to getting saved, there's zero connection between faith and works. But obviously, we should connect faith and works after that we are saved to have a perfect faith, to become a friend of God. And somebody who's truly saved, they have at least the ability to do a work and labor out of unfeigned love. Doesn't mean that they always do it, but if they actually do it, hey, God knows, you know, that is a proof that they are saved because somebody who isn't saved doesn't even have the ability to do an actual work on labor of love. And maybe some of this stuff wasn't really new to you, but uh, I hope that you, that I could at least help you understand Hebrews chapter 6 a bit better 
versus 9 and 10, because those are kind of hard, you know, the way th those verses are connected. So it's not really obvious the first couple of times you read it, maybe. So um, maybe you also underlined a verse in your Bible, John chapter 15, 14, you could um, tell that somebody at the door or soul winning. And anyways, I hope that uh, you would get, get a balanced view on everything, but especially when it comes to faith and works and that the sermon helped you to get a balanced view. And let's just pray.